I love music movies and music driven films or musicals and although this isn't a traditional musical it's 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 very much driven and told through song. I love working with Brett his films and he has a great writing partner named Mark Bash and they they write these movies that are just really human stories so there are moments of drama that always make me cry. His movies, his movies make me cry warm tears, but they also make me laugh. It's just really a film about love and about uh, acceptance and uh, creation. It's, it's all about the creative process. And I, I think right now people will enjoy the feelings that they get from this movie. So you're feeling good. Take that home with you. We all need it. Several of you stayed. <laughs> before we, they're not going to let me get a word in here, so just quickly, before, before we throw it to the audience, just, you know, um, I mean, you wrote this, too, so can you talk about why and, and it, both the writing and the casting, because they're both so, so great. Yeah, uh, I have a great writing partner, Mark Bash. We've done our, my, uh, my last three films, I'll See You in My Dreams, The Hero, and now this. And we have a very special relationship, and I, I kind of always am thinking of ideas. And this hit me one day. I, I couldn't tell you when or how, but I was like, I want to do a movie about a father and daughter that start a band in the last summer. It just hit me. I was like, that's what I want to do. Um, because I love this subgenre, the band music genre. I'm a huge music fan. Movies like um, That Thing You Do, High Fidelity, uh, inside Lewin Davis, um, once they're they're real soul filling films, and music is a great way to express emotion. So instead of like an action sequence or a big dialogue scene or something like that, I wanted to be able to express what was going on with the characters and the narrative through song. But I wanted to do it in a grounded, realistic way. Even though I love proper musicals, I didn't want to do a proper musical yet. I do want to make one at some point. Um, if you're listening, if you're hiring. <laughs> um, so it was really, you know, that subgenre wanting to go into that. And then this deals with some themes that I just, I just wanted to investigate. I'm always theme driven as a filmmaker. I want to start with the theme and let that drive the, you know, I'm character over plot always. So I'm just like, what is the journey and what do I want to say to an audience and how am I feeling about certain things? And I wrote, I wrote the part of Frank Fisher, or I should say we wrote the part of Frank Fisher for... Mr. Offerman, because we love him so much. And I wanted to see Nick, and I think all of you wanted to see Nick, because I'm a fan of his in a big leading man role, because that's what he is. Showbiz. <laughs> so yeah. So yeah. And obviously this cast is ridiculously incredible. Kiersey Clemens, as you all now know, is insanely gifted. And, um, and, and then when you get Ted Danson, and I've worked with Blythe Danner, and you've got Sasha Lane, who's amazing. You've got Tony Collette. It's... it's so it, we just, we got really lucky. I got the cast I wanted. Nick was hugely helpful with helping with that. And these are tiny movies. We make them completely outside of the, the industry. These are true independent films. We take them to festivals. We try to get them picked up. We try to get them distributed. This movie is going to be distributed. It'll be in theaters this summer. <laughs> Nationwide. So, so tweet, face, whatever, do all that. Stuff. I don't know. I don't want to start shilling. Face tweet, Max face tweet, point, yeah, all MySpace, that shit. Please MySpace it. You know, <laughs> friendster. Insta jizz. Fuck it up. <laughs> so I think we've covered it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll go to the audience. You. All right. All right. Hi, my name's Nico. I'm an NYU film student. My question is for Nick. Um, the um, before the show, you told a story about. Uh, not getting to see Tom Waits at South By 20 years ago. And then in the film, there's a scene where Sam pulls out a Tom Waits record and says, you can't sell this. So that was, in my mind, a very personal touch from you. Were there any other personal touches that we might not have picked up on during, in the film? Well, there, there was a lot of personal touches. Most, the, the, the film is riddled with Brett's personal touches, and that's actually his personal touch. 
that record has a great significance to him and his brother. Um, but also, I mean, it's Tom Waits, so <laughs> for many of us, you know, like... You should not sell that for $3. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of stuff, like, we both freak out about Tom Waits and Jeff Tweedy and Wilco and, you know, a lot of the, <clears throat> a lot of the more older musical acts uh, <laughs> I was also on board with. And then Brett had to teach me about Animal Collective and Songs Ohio and... Uh, Mit Mitski? Mitski. Mitski, yeah. the great Mitski, who's amazing, but I didn't know about her, you know, so. So it, it, it's full of, you know, Easter eggs like that, but I'd say, you know, 95% of them are this guy right here. I, I have one bit of stage direction. Just move up from the screen a little bit. We just hope you're dangerously close to the screen. Shadows. Thank you. All no, right. it's just touching the screen. Is No, you done? Thank you. All right. Okay. All right. <laughs> We're so close to it, though, so magical. Please don't sit on the furniture. <laughs> well, first off, thank you for making this movie. It made me cry and it made me laugh and uh, it ignited my bones. Amazing. And it was just... <laughs> you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> That's the context. <laughs> but, now uh, I get it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, the music, you know, these movies are so hit or miss if, 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 unless you have the exact right music and you found yeah. it for this. Can you talk about that process? Yeah, I mean, it's the, it's the biggest fear, right? If, if you guys don't dig the songs, you're not going to dig the movie. And, and, you know, I knew what style of music that I wanted to do. And it's got to come from the characters. It's got to come from Frank and Sam. And I didn't want to create a band that was like, oh, that's not the music they would play. So it's like guitar and bass, and I want to rock out mixed with like, I want to use the Ableton push and the keys and synth. So, I, you know, bands like the XX and stuff were like big influences. And the incredible Keegan DeWitt, who wrote all the songs in this movie and the score, um, he's, I call him the wizard. He's incredible. He turns this stuff around so fast. And they pull a lot of narrative weight. You know, when, when Sam sings Blink at the end of the movie, that's a goodbye to Rose. And hopefully you guys picked up on that. And then when they sing Everything Must Go, that's like, hey, Dad, thank you. I love you. Let's have some fun. I'll always appreciate you. And so they have to do a lot of narrative lifting. But they also have to be catchy and fun. And hopefully you all will want to buy the soundtrack when it comes out real soon. So... I give all the credit to Keegan and, and his writing partner who helped us execute this stuff, Jeremy Bullock. They're just brilliant, and they just executed exactly what I needed, and I just, luck, I just lucked out being a collaborator with Keegan in my last movies and him being able to do this. Well, congratulations to all of you. Great Thank job. you very much. Thank you so much. Appreciate your words. Thank you. Just in case you guys up, up, up there don't realize it, there are microphones down here on this floor. If you want to come down and ask a question, you're welcome to. Go ahead. Sweet. Please Two. don't touch the screen. <laughs> Two questions, one for Brett and one for Nick. First question for Brett is, um, as the writer and director for this, you know, I want to know a little bit more about how much direction you gave Keegan for the songs that you wanted written, either style-wise or even dialogue and lyrics within those songs. And the second question is for Nick. Um, whenever you're free and you're in Austin, let's start a band and let's hang out. <laughs> I really loved it. You're not busy. Copy not that. at all. So you go first. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it, it, was a it was a true collaboration like anything in, f in filmmaking is. When, when it's done right, you're, you're truly allowing other people to put their take. That's why you hire them. You okay. don't try to control. So I tried to give Keegan a very long leash and say, this is what I want. I want it to sound like this. I want Ableton. I want guitar. I want to you know, mix all this stuff. And then he would show me little things and I would give some notes. But ironically, lyrically, he was just so on point. Like when I heard the lyrics for Blink, I was like crying. And I was like, how did you do this? This is insane. Um, so he, it's, it's really his gift. And I, and I wish I could take more credit for it, but I'm, I can't. That's awesome. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. Um, I, uh, I'm busy. I completely <laughs> understand. Great work. No, also, though, I, I just want to say I um, I have some friends in the house that are pro musicians, and uh, I play acoustic guitar and perform uh, stupid songs that make people laugh, and that's something I'm I'm competent at. But th this is my first time playing electric guitar, and Jeremy, the writing partner of Keegan, 
really coached me, and I had to f work really hard to get my fingers to play those riffs, <laughs> which I, if you're a guitar player, you're like, oh, that's pretty, pretty rudimentary. But for me, that was like Olympic pole vaulting. <laughs> so you might not, might be careful about asking me to be in your band. You Congratulations, it's an incredible. I'm good with a rhythm egg. <laughs> <laughs> Tambourine. That's, That's right. not a euphemism. Thank you. <laughs> uh, this side, go ahead. Um, well, I had three, qu uh, three questions, and all of them have been answered now, so fuck my life. <laughs> anyway. Hey, you're all right. Um, Talk about so something So I'm else. just going to make something up. Are sure. you ready for it? First of all, I want to say when you make that musical, call me. I'm open and uh, can be in it. You know? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Got to shoot my shot. <laughs> anyway, um, so something that I kind of noticed is that there's so many kind of American family nuances that are so normalized in this movie, like... Sam just likes girls. It's not a plot point. Yeah. It's not like she's hiding it from her dad. And like, it's a biracial family. It's not like, oh, this is a scandal. It's just like, this is a normal American family. What was kind of your, your thought process incorporating those things that, that are normal? I think it's really important always, but now more than ever, uh, representation is key. <laughs> uh, that's a given. Now, be, beyond that, as someone who is white and male, <laughs> I have to be extremely aware of, of how I'm representing something that I know nothing of. That I don't, I don't know what it's like mm -hmm. to be a queer woman or a woman of color. I, I don't. Right. So what I did, and what's important and what I try to tell everyone is listen. So when Kiersey came on and Sasha came on, who are both women of color, who both happen, and I did not know this at the time when I, when I cast them, but both who identify as queer, I changed the script per their, like, this is how it works, Brett. And a lot of things came out of the script that dealt with it, that maybe they would talk about it. Um, my wife is of mixed race. Sorry, I get emotional when I talk about it. And my nephews are, and it is America. And... No, it's not normalizing it, it's just simply putting America on the screen the way, um, it's America at its best and I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful to be able to be in a position to do it and I'm gonna continue to try to do it and I'm gonna continue to listen and do it right. I just want to let you know, you did a great job, and I am your biggest fan. I am done now. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. um, so I have two things. They're both for Nick. Uh, the first one was you're really known for playing um, a very like serious stereotype. Was it fun for you to be kind of more goofy? Was it difficult to be a character that's more goofy? And the second thing is, um, I just want to take this opportunity to let you know Parks and Rec inspired my television career, and today I got accepted into my college of my choice for television production, and I just wanted to thank you for inspiring me so much. So. Well, <laughs> look at all this love in this room, man. <laughs> yeah. Your first question, uh, that's none of your business. <laughs> And your second question was a declarative sentence. That was not a question. <laughs> Tell me, what, what was your first question again? <laughs> Did you like being more of a goofy character? And like oh, sure, yeah, that's a great that? question. Thank you. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I come from Chicago theater, and I... I uh, so I, and, and that's not to be conflated with Chicago comedy, the, uh, like Amy Poehler and Tina Fey, they came from. They learned, you know, they went to Second City and Improv Olympic and they learned sketch and improv. I come from snobby theater where we do Ibsen plays and think <laughs> we're, you know, we're like, what, you're making up shit in a bar. I'm performing literature. Good luck with that, ladies. Uh, <laughs> I'm going straight to Cleveland. Um, so I, 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 you know, cut my teeth playing whatever's on the season. We never had to specialize. You're, you're a comedian, you're a dr dramatist, you're just an actor. And so I don't identify with any particular character in my, you know, in my career. 
uh, Ron Swanson was much more visible than most of my other characters, so people think, oh, that's the guy who talks slowly with a mustache. <laughs> and that's great, it's a wonderful problem to have, but uh, I've gotten to do way stupider, uh, you know, lighthearted stuff and way more dramatic stuff, but I've never gotten to play something on screen this fleshed out and sort of this just uh, realistically human. I mean, there were scenes that scene on, on Tony's uh, threshold where I'm just vulnerable, trying to figure out how to get, her to, to get kissed, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I was so excited. I kept saying, Brett, I've ne I'm 47. I've never gotten to do a scene like this. I'm so grateful. And so that's what really moved me was also just I've never played a character that was big enough that you, we cared how his day is going. Mm -hmm. So we would shoot a scene of like me walking down the sidewalk. And I was like, wow, you just fucking care how my day is going. <laughs> this is amazing. We always care about you, Nick. Always. I love this. So, you know. You we're very excited about getting me shooting you walking on a sidewalk. I was so psyched, dude. You were, yeah. And I'm happy to have given you that gift. Thank you. Yeah. I, I sincerely thank you. And as to your second question, congratulations. And yeah, good congrats. luck. Good luck. Save us. Save our planet. You can go ahead. Because he came later, so you, you've been waiting longer. All right. Um, my name is Hafi. I'm, I'm, I myself is a struggling musician from Pakistan. So I really connected with this movie. And uh, one thing I would like to say that never be sorry for showing off your emotions. It's perfectly normal. But <laughs> <laughs> Nick, you were here like 20 years ago, and you weren't able to get in. Now you're your movie is playing at this motherfucking theater, right? <laughs> so shed some light on your 20 years of journey from backstage, <laughs> from front of the stage. <laughs> can, we, can we bring the lights down a little bit? <laughs> Everybody come closer. <clears throat> 1998 was a, a dry year. Uh, I mean, I don't know, to nutshell it, uh, I, th it was the first, I was here in a movie called Treasure Island, which was a very uh, brave, creative, experimental festival film that I'm really proud of. It was at Sundance and then it came here and both experiences I, I, uh, would, would set me off on what has become my bread and butter, which is small independent films that have a much more profound creative vision than studio films uh, because they don't have a big budget, so they don't have bankers on set worrying about choices the filmmaker's making. Um, and so I, uh, I, I've been doing films like this for a long time, but it's, uh, you know, it, we live in a time where there's a lot of films being made. And so if you're lucky enough to keep getting to do them, Eventually, some nutbag is like, "Hey, why don't we make you? Why don't we give you a big part?" <laughs> like, all right, uh, that sounds good. Um, that, that's, I mean, that's pretty much it. I, I will say this: uh, at the time, it was in my the, the two dark years of my life. Bless you. In my late twenties, I had moved to L.A. from Chicago from a theater career that was very uh, exciting and, and satisfying to uh, not much going on in LA, and I was very confused, drinking a lot of bourbon, I, I was depressed. And uh, at the end of that two years, shortly after this, uh, my, my first time here, I said, I just have to do a play. That's what my life has been based on. So I found a play to do, and I met my wife, Megan Mullally, in that play. <laughs> and I, I, I've always been very moved that I said, I'm, I'm I'm fucked, like my, I'm having a really hard time, so I'm gonna go back to my creative foundation, which is theater, and I did, and it's fucking made my life. And so, uh, from then on, which was the year 2000, I, uh, I, I didn't care how things went, because my life was happy, which is, it's kind of what this movie is about, is if, if you make sure that your love relationships are healthy, if you make sure your garden is cultivated, then you know. Even if a, even if a network executive rejects you, you can still go home and have delicious vegetables. <laughs> Thank you. 
Go ahead. Hi. Um, first of all, love the movie. Um, I'm so excited that you said it was going to be picked up. I can't wait to like pay money to watch this movie. Oh my god! It's I a would, crazy idea you got I, there. What? <laughs> wow. Um, my actual question is: um, I totally thought for a minute that um, Sam was going to stay home. They were going to go on tour. They were going to make music together, and you know, live happily ever after. And she was going to stay with her girlfriend or whatever. Um, why did you choose to end it like that? I mean, I'm not mad at the ending, but Oh, like, sure. No, it's a good question. It, it was really realistic. I was just like, why'd you end it like that? Y you just answered it. It's really um, realistic. realistic. It's really <laughs> realistic. I mean, well, but truly to me, Sam, look, it, as Nick was saying, he's getting on some of the themes in this film are about, we all have aspirations. We all have goals. We want to do certain things. I never wanted this movie to be about fame or money. We've all seen those band movies and they're great. I didn't want to go down that well-beaten path of like, and they get second place in the thing, and then they, you know, I don't, I mean, I've, I've seen it, we've all seen it. Yeah. To me, these stakes were emotional, and it was important that Sam can do both. She can be a doctor and an amazing musician, and if one works out better than the other, follow that path. It, we're not, and Sasha gives away one of the themes in one of the first scenes of the movie, she says, we're all made of more than just one thing when they're looking at the art. And that's, and it's true. We don't have to be defined by one thing. So for me, it was important that, and she's still collaborating with her dad. You know, he's, she's still like, help me out with the bridge. She's still performing, but she's still in school. She's figuring her shit out. And to me, it was like, I didn't want to be like, rip all that away, so. Cause it's Sam, the character, she has the, the passion and the desire to be a doctor and a musician. So try both for a little while. She's only 18. You know, she's got, she can figure it out. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I love that, that it's not, it's not a Hollywood ending. Yeah. It's actually a happier ending because it's a realistic victory. Like they make the adult choice. They do the wholesome thing. But the music continues anyway. And they still have a relationship. Yeah. Absolutely. It brought them closer together. And that's what this movie's about. It's about bringing a father and a daughter becoming friends again. I mean... That's really all it is. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You and then we'll go. You could you? I was actually keeping track of the time. You and then we'll go back over to you. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Brittley. Um, Hello, Brittany. <laughs> Brittley. Brittley. Oh, Hello, yes. Brittley. Hi. Um, I couldn't come up here without saying, my heart is beating so loud right now. <laughs> it truly is, and you reminded me why I got in, into acting in the first place, and that's because of connection and relationship. And that's everything. That's all we really need. And I think you did a beautiful job executing that. All I wanted to do was connect to each of these characters and love them. And our need, I, I, I believe our world right now just needs love. You're here. <laughs> um. <laughs> I, I agree with you, and it's why it's why I made this movie. And I mean, and I don't I don't really care. I told you guys before the movie, like I'm unabashedly telling you, I'm I've made a feel good movie. There's so much cynicism in the world. There's a lot of cynicism and anger in cinema, and there should be. There should be anger in cinema right now, and there should be different ways. But there's also room for this too. I think that there's room to come for 90 minutes and feel good and be reminded that there are people, hopefully people in your life that love you and that you love and that those are the most important things. These are about the small moments that are actually the biggest. And I, my goal is, is to make people be reminded of that and feel good and laugh and cry and nod their heads to amazing pop tunes and, and walk out feeling great. So that means the world to me, that it, that it hit you that way. And it, if, if it hits one person, I've, I've done my job. It's hit me, and I will carry it. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, this question is for Brett. Um, as a writer, uh, what steps did you take at the beginning to get your work noticed and eventually kickstart your career to where you are now? I always tell filmmakers uh, that writing is key. Like, I never thought I was a writer. I wanted to direct always. So writing was a means to an end. So I learned how to do it. People say, I don't have the gift of writing. I still don't think I have the gift of writing. I, I found a great writing partner eventually, and I couldn't do it without him. But I think it's important to create stuff. And 
my career or lack thereof is based on doing the work. So I would just make, constantly make films, shorts, features. I made my first feature length film. I wouldn't call it a feature. <laughs> when I was 16, I just, you, you know, you just keep creating things and the more that you create, the better you're gonna get. It's the only way you can do it. So you just have to keep writing, even if it's bad and you've gotta be able to have people read it and say, this isn't very good. You're not gonna learn much from successes. You're gonna learn from the failures. And I had a ton of failure leading up to my first film, which was a $5,000 feature. And then I, I did Kickstarter to make I'll See You in My Dreams. You know, that was the only way that I made that movie. And I don't recommend doing Kickstarter. I don't recommend it. <laughs> I mean, if you, it, it's, I, when, I don't mean that the, the platform is great, but it's a full-time job and it's really hard. So I just didn't take no for an answer and just and said, I think I have a voice and I'm gonna keep trying and I'm still trying. It's still a, it, incredibly hard to get movies like this made. But they're being made. So ju you know, just keep, the, it's all about the work. It's gotta be about the work, not about the result. Thank you. Go ahead. Hi guys. <laughs> My name's Isabel. Um, I just wanted to say that I love the movie also and I actually came into it not in the loop. Like I had, I, this is my first South by event, and I just happened across it, so I came with no expectations. That's, we like that. We really yeah. like that. <laughs> and it was amazing. I really loved it. Um, so my question for you, mm -hmm. I don't know if you mentioned it. Um, excuse me. You did say uh, you've always wanted to do a father-daughter um, movie, but did you mention how you, like, what inspired that? Or, I, and I, if you didn't... Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, my, my inspirations come in weird waves, mm -hmm. but I definitely knew that I wanted to do a story about a dad. Um, dads are weird, you know? <laughs> like men and dad, like good dads are rare. And I wanted to depict a good dad, I think. There was something inside of me that wanted that experience. He's obviously flawed and goofy and, <laughs> I'm talking about Nick, not the character. No. I'm <laughs> But I, I think Hang that, on now. yeah, I, th I, I think that there was something in, in the depiction of a good dad that I, I just felt like was kind of missing, that, that felt hopefully real and organic and not forced or bullshit. So I think there was something there, but I didn't know that when I wrote it. That was like an after the fact thing. A lot of times the movie reveals itself, like the reasons reveal themselves to you after you've made the film. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of hit me later. I was like, oh, I needed to make this like dad tale. I don't have, because I don't have any kids, but I think about having kids and I think about what it would be like to be a dad. So it's sort of like a message to me, like, hey man, be a good dad. <laughs> You're gonna be, even if you have like, you know, whatever, just be, be good. Awesome. We've had, the, we've had the luxury of letting this run super long, but I just, yeah. these are gonna be the, everyone at the mic now, you guys are the, the last ones, just to make everyone clear. Go ahead. Sure. Um, second question is for Nick. Um, kind of outside of the, the movie, uh, woodworking? I'm married. Oh, good. <laughs> Me too. Okay. So it's still not cool. I love cool. Megan, by the way. She's awesome. Um, about, <laughs> about woodworking. What, what got you into woodworking? Uh, I got into woodworking very organically. I grew up using tools. My family are farmers. My dad was an amateur furniture maker. I used to frame houses uh, as a job to get money for college. In theater school, I began building scenery for money. Uh, I continued in Chicago, building scenery during the day and acting in plays at night. And then when I moved to LA, uh, I couldn't get the same thing going on, but I had become pretty skilled in a shop and I sort of tricked, I realized uh, I could make furniture. And then, so it was in my late 20s, I suddenly said, holy shit, I could make amazing like heirloom furniture. And I freaked out and became a woodworker. <laughs> Very cool. Awesome. Well, thank you both. Thank you thank very you. much. Go ahead. Hi. Yeah. Um, first of all, yeah. I wanted to say thank you very much. This is really a very special movie. One of I haven't seen many of such movies before, and I, it really, really, I really liked it. Um, I have two questions for Brad. Like the first question would be: um, So last year you brought us the hero, and now you brought us this movie. What will you bring us next year? <laughs> and the second question. I is also have that question. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we want to see you again too, by the way. So don't don't run away. Thank you. And uh, the second question would be, um, like, can you tell us more about the writing process with a writing partner? Like, sure. How does it work? Like, how do you guys do it? 
Sure. So uh, Mark and I have already written our next movie. I, I probably won't be able to make it for next year because I'm trying to make a bigger movie. It's, it's going to be a really a, a challenge, but I'm, I'm ready. It's more of a genre film, but it's, it's again, it's sort of like, I think this is a subgenre, and we kind of did our own thing with it, so we're trying to do our own thing. And the easiest way to describe it is like an Spaceships. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I do want to make a spaceship movie. The thing is, I want to make every kind of movie, so I'm trying to make, I'm doing an, it's an action movie, but it's really character heart driven. So we'll see if anyone lets me do that. Um, and working with a writing partner, I wouldn't be able to write without Mark. And uh, we never write in the same room. We both live in Brooklyn, but we, we uh, it's only via text, phone calls, and, and, and Dropbox. That's it. And, and he'll write 10 pages and send to me, I'll rewrite the 10 or edit the 10 and then write 10 more or, or two or whatever we can get done in the day. He works in the morning and I work in the afternoon and that's it. It just goes back and forth and then we'll argue or, or not and then s sometimes a movie comes out of it. But we're really open to notes and we, we, uh, I, we were rewriting, I rewrite on, uh, when I'm on set, I'll cut stuff, I'm, I'm listening to the actors Mark is usually on set with me. I'm never like, this is the way it has to be. I'm, I'm always like, if it doesn't sound right or doesn't feel right, change it, cut it. Again, letting Sasha and Kiersey inform things about their characters that they can relate to. Listening to Nick, if he's like, I, I, wouldn't, I don't feel like this is right, you've gotta be able to hear that. So we're rewriting, you're writing always on movies. It's a constant, so. Cool, yeah, thank you very much again. Thank you. Good. Hi, I just wanted to ask about the experience for each of you, what it was like to, this many years on, giving direction to and acting against Ted Danson behind a bar. <laughs> right? Yeah, that was fucking day one, dude. Yeah. I was like, oh, hey, what's on the schedule for day one? They're like, Nick is here. Well, I know Nick. Uh, Ted Danson's behind a bar and Tony Collette. Good luck. I was like, oh my God, you know. Yeah, getting Ted dancing behind a bar is a big deal to me. And so that's all I've got to say. I was, he's the fucking greatest guy on planet Earth. I got that too. Yeah, um, the thing about Ted is he, he is ridiculously sweet, uh, annoyingly charming, and he's so good looking. He's 92 years old. <laughs> and... You, I still can't stand next to him in a photo because it's like, who's, who's 80s era Rob Lowe? Oh, it's Ted Danson. The guy's a f fucking ancient. And so then with knowing th that he has that magic, imagine looking him in the eye and remembering dialogue. You're fucked. He makes it, you a terrible actor because you're like, Jesus Christ, look at the jaw on this guy. Uh, I've oh, put you with shit. two of the most handsome men of that age range I know, probably it's, it's, around. It's a test. Sam Elliott and Ted Dancy, just put him with them, with Nick. But Ted, Ted's incredible and I'm a huge Cheers fan. And the fact that he, the thing that's great about Ted is he didn't even really care. I was like, you're back behind the bar and blah, blah. He's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I like the part, let's do it. You know, like, and he can't bartend for shit. No. <laughs> He broke a fucking shot glass. <laughs> Pouring a shot, putting a shot glass on a bar, it broke and he almost cut himself. It's and I was like, you did this for 20 years or something, man. He's it's like, hard to break a shot glass. It is. <laughs> They're thick. We had to pay back Sonny's for it. was a yeah. mess. No. Other than that, he was a treat. Yeah, he's the best. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hey guys, All right. so, I just wanted to say kind of as a, as a piano player, congrats, because this, that's totally what it's like, uh, being in a room and, and making music with, with people. It made me feel, feel good. Awesome. But, uh, uh, my question is kind of related to him. The, the daughter's name was, t was Sam, yeah. and uh, Ted Dance's Tending Bar, were these con conscious cheers decisions? or? <laughs> it's, a, it's two things. Um, I love. I, first of all, I, I love that name. Uh, just and I love it uh, for for a, a woman, for a female character. I think it's just a cool name. Um, but uh, Sam Elliott is one of my BFFs. Humble brag. Um, 
He was in my last two movies, and I adore him. And um, he, he and I, uh, I, I would work with him till the end of time if I could. And um, so, and he wasn't in this movie for a lot of different reasons. A very busy guy and things. And so, uh, it was. Uh, you know what? I've never really consciously thought about. It. I think about Sam Elliott. I, I, the Sam Malone thing. I was like, oh yeah, Sam Malone too. <laughs> but um, I think it was more Sam Elliott than it was Sam Malone. I think. Cool. There you go. Yeah. Thanks, guys. It was, Brett, Brett is actually not telling the entire truth. Uh, if you, it also alludes to the film, I Am Sam. <laughs> and if, if you go watch that film again, you'll find, the, you'll find several references to the lyrics of our songs. <laughs> and then if you, after that, listen to the songs again, there is a body buried in Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And I'm going to leave it at that. I'll also give you the number 37. <laughs> and we'll leave it at that. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank, thank you so you. much. Awesome. Thank you, Janet. Thank, thank you guys for sticking around. It was great. Thank, thank you. you.